Friends, good morning to you all. A very warm welcome to our morning worship service. A joy to see God together in worship. Let's come before him, shall we? Sing in Psalm 65. This is Sing Psalms 65, page 82. And we can sing verses 1 to 7. Psalm 65, page 82. Psalm that reminds us that God hears and answers our prayers. In Zion, praise awaits you, Lord. To you our vows we'll pay. To you all people will come near. You hear us when we pray. Let's sing down to verse 7. We read in verse 6. By strength and power you formed the hills. You hushed the ocean's voice. You calmed the tumult of their waves and stilled the people's noise. Verses 1 to 7. Let's sing Psalm 65. Sing Psalms. In Zion praise awaits you, Lord. And Zion praise awaits you, Lord, to Let's join together in prayer, shall we? Let's pray. Lord, our God, to think that we are talking to you, the God we've sung about and sung to, that the psalmist was so truly amazed and astonished at how you had dealt with him and showed yourself not only able, which is never the question, but willing, which is the question, to answer his prayers. And he describes them in the plural as answering our prayers. By awesome deeds, by fearful works, he says, in righteousness. That your answers express your character. At the time, maybe we don't understand how or where, but maybe later we can look back and see. And as well, he describes how People in the farthest seas, foreigners to him, would upon discovering your living presence and power in answering prayer, would come to put their hope in you. 
And Lord, we maybe see ourselves living where we do in that very description and how you chose in the Old Testament time to largely confine your dealings with the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, though with exceptions like Rahab and chapter before we read this morning, the widow in Zarephah, the one who you used to provide for Elijah, foreign in terms of territory that belonged, well, in a sense, under Baalism, under Ahab and Jezebel, the land had become so infected and polluted that it was as, as good as given over. But you weren't finished, and you never will be until the end comes on that final day that the Old Testament describes as the day of the Lord and carried over into the New Testament. But in between the first and second comings of your Son, our Lord, your work is continuing. And your work will continue. Upon this rock, you said, I will build my church. And the gates of hell, the gates of death even, will not prevail against it. Nothing and no one is any challenge or any match or in any way real opposition to you. Only when there's a possibility of success. When we see in your sovereignty and in your majesty and glory, you allow things to happen. You allow people to seem for the time being to get the upper hand. It's all part of a greater purpose that you've got. And even in the chapter following where we read this morning, the conversation you have with Elijah, and you explain that while it maybe looked like it was over, that there was still work to do, but that that work was going to involve other people and that he would have a successor, Elisha, and certain kings would be anointed and servants who would continue to fulfill your purpose. And that is always our hope. And it's always our joy when challenged maybe to question what's happening in our society, in our churches, in our families, all around us in the world. We, we don't question you in the sense of demand an explanation or an answer or anything. But like with some of the other Psalms, where 65 we've sung from is so glowing and so elevated and so full of thanksgiving and gratitude for answered prayer. There's other times when the Psalms are so different and the prophets give expression to how things really are. And we're thankful for that as well. The balance that you give very often so that we can appreciate the light and the liberty when having seen the darkness and the bondage, or maybe even having felt it. And we are in times, Lord, as we look around us and we see that the darkness, the horror, the thick darkness, the sin and the abandonment of the Bible and of the light of the glorious gospel from so many places in society where there was always that influence, but at the same time that we be preserved from sinking where Elijah sunk and others have sunk, and while others have maybe criticized him for being full of self-pity, he said to you mistakenly that he was the only one left when he wasn't, and we need to remember that as well, that you always have your people and always will, and your plan is always being unfolded step by step in our personal lives as well. There's that amazing time in, in, uh, in Hagar's life, sent away by Sarah and forced by Abraham, Sarah forcing him to throw her out. Sarah thinks she can get rid of her problems that way. And when Hagar there may be feeling so vulnerable and used, not asking for any of the things that happened to her, but abandoned and kicked out. But you met her, your angel met her, the angel of the Lord met her, provided for her. And she said, you are a God who sees me, for you are a God of seeing. 
What a joy to discover it in our own personal experience. That you know us like Psalm 139. You know our our, um, sitting down, our rising up. You know our thoughts before they could become words and the desires and intentions before they become thoughts. And all our motivations and everything about us. And Lord, we thank you for the fact that we can't even begin to think of how utterly exhausting it would be to try and confess every single thing or to try and explain every single detail of what we're asking in prayer. But the fact that you know us, sometimes we don't have the words to put round the thoughts. Sometimes like Romans 8, it's these amazing groans that are too deep for words, that are themselves expressive of the presence of the Holy Spirit in that prayer. No doubt it's similar to what we read of in James 5, around that context where he explains Elijah's prayerfulness and um, he emphasizes the prayer of faith. We can't muster enough up. We sometimes feel we've got so little praying. There's other times there may seem to be or feel to be a certainty about the issue. Maybe when praying for others more clearly And the answer can come so wonderfully. And it's you alone who knows what's happened. For we ask, Lord, for every one of us gathered today where there are those laboring in prayer and knowing that and waiting and expecting and hoping and longing for answers to come. That you will grant that answer, Lord, that they seek. That in your grace you will give and provide and Show yourself in such grace and mercy, revealing your righteous character in the way you answer, doing the right thing, as you always will. We come to your word this morning and pray to be reminded and refreshed, revived. We open the scriptures in your presence, your word to us. And as we read, help us. So easy to get distracted. We have to confess it can happen even in the reading of the word. The mind can be attacked and taken away and easy to lose the place. And so in the reading of the word and in our study and meditation, we ask, Lord, that you will be present to make it real and powerful and life-changing for all of us. Our gathering together wouldn't be to keep up a tradition, but out of real longing and desire to seek the living God, that you would reveal yourself to all of us And there may be that divine power, that divine drawing throughout our community. We thank you, Lord, for your wisdom and sovereignty. And we seek to be in line and pray to be in line and in agreement with what you're doing and what you're saying to us. Any may be seeking specific guidance that you will guide them and lead them in your way. And when it doesn't seem to make sense to others or sometimes even to themselves, No one claims to be Abraham. It can sometimes feel like being Abraham. When the Lord sends and we don't know where we're going. It can be a duty. It can be a privilege. It can be anything. In the course of any day or something may be life changing. But that you will give that guidance and that certainty and that faith. Because when that sense of divine guidance has come, it will be tested. Sometimes very tested. But at the end, the certainty is going to be there far more than it was to start with. A bit like, though not the same, what you said to Peter when, about his faith and the feelings. And you said to him, when you turn again, when you are converted, strengthen your brothers. You would have thought that one of the lowest and perplexing of experiences one of your greatest disciples went through, that in many respects could have, and maybe may have looked to him or others as the end of the road for him. It was just the beginning. So, Lord, we never should ever give up hope. We are in your gracious hands. The miracle, Lord, is being here today. The miracle is, is that we want you and are praying to you. And the miracle of that is that you have put it in our hearts, that you sustain it in your people's hearts. When their own hearts, our hearts, and things going on, and the, the darkness, the spirit of darkness, The enemies of our soul will do everything to quench and extinguish 
any semblance of fire or burning within us. Heaven word and God word. We read of that, though not the same thing, on Wednesday with the, the dragon spewing out a river to drown the woman. And the world swallowed it up. The church, the Christian, doesn't want what he's got to give. His lies, his promises. We sometimes fail and take what he's saying and uh, we struggle with the process. But to listen to your word and to know that what he's saying is not true. And even when it's true, it'll be half true or with the intention of keeping us from you. When he condemns us, our hearts condemn us. And um, it can be in such a way we struggle to pray. We know then that conviction isn't from above, but it's from someone who wants us to stay away from you. But grant to us, Lord, as we meet, our hearts will be open to your word, every one of us. Remember our congregation. Remember all our people, Lord. We pray for those connected to us, our families extended families pray for those away just now remember all who are ill who are mourning we ask lord for help for those who are in, in extreme difficulty and they maybe don't know who to say it to or what to say we ask lord for those who are really downcast and outside they look fine as we say lord you know and uh, you are able to meet you're the one who will carry the lambs in your bosom and you will gently lead those that are with young. Your care is astonishing. The way you can deal with us, though you are the mighty and the glorious and the irresistible creator, sustainer of all reality. You have numbered the stars. You've set them in their place. You know every one of them. And yet you are so, can we say, self-humbling, bowing yourself down, You set, like Psalm 113 says, those who are in the dung heap. You set them in the place of privilege with your people. This is what you do. The downcast, the outcast, the rejected. You're the one who takes them. And you're the one who, we've read it in the gospel so often, you change lives. Some people are looking for you without knowing it. Other people are quite happy with the way they're living, so they think. But you have that amazing way of entering into every situation, every life. And so grant, we pray, that you will speak to all of us and to all who we love. Remember the world around us, Lord, the chaos, the upheaval. We're saying remember. It's not you don't know. We don't mean that. But remember in terms of intervene. And to show and reveal yourself in these situations all around the world where every solution and explanation is typical man-centered, man-caused, and man will be the cure. And what we see, Lord, is that so many people and those in influence and all of that, they're acting like they're God themselves. But you are able to stop all of these things, and we believe you will. The day is coming, whatever comes before it, where the nations will tremble at your presence. Behold, he is coming with clouds. Every eye will see him. To think of that, the high and the mighty, Lord, today. We see them in all of these interviews, and we see them behind their desks or sitting on their thrones or out on the battlefield and shouting the odds, claiming this, accusing that. And the day's coming when every earthly sovereign who has ever lived will stand before the presence of the King of Kings and be utterly silent when you come to judge the nations. And all of us, too, we don't need to think of anyone else but the thought of standing before you and giving an account of ourselves, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to give account of the things done in the body, whether good or whether evil. But the joy that Jude speaks of when he says we're to be where we are among those, I unto him, he says, who is able to keep you from falling, finally falling, and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power. And what a thought to stand blameless in your presence. Now we are in the sense of being legally set free through justification, but there to be personally and to be morally and to be totally 
free from the presence of sin and to experience and to know something of the likeness that you will give your people to yourself. May we know what that means as we look forward and help us in the meantime to be looking for that blessed hope. Remember the children here, Lord. Thank you for them and for the Sunday school, for the teaching and for the teachers and for the creche, for having young people, for having families. We don't underestimate this privilege and this joy congregationally. And a look here or there might highlight the favor that you've shown and the investment here for sharing and passing on your word and the joy of life and the joy of the reality, Lord, of a generation coming in your will and providence. We pray for them. that You will turn all their hearts to you. And we ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue singing and turn to Psalm 50, 50, Scottish Psalter, 50th Psalm, first edition. This is page 276, first version, not edition. Psalm 50, first version, page 276, verses 1 to 5. Notice the reference to fire in verse 3. The mighty God, verse 1 reads, The Lord hath spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to where he hath his fall from out of Zion Hill, which of excellency and beauty the perfection is, God shined gloriously. Let's sing to verse 5. Psalm 50, page 276. The mighty God, the Lord. The mighty God, the Lord, has spoken and did call the earth from rising of the sun to Let's read this morning from 1 Kings chapter 18. 1 Kings 18. Let's read from the beginning. Read the whole chapter together. 1 Kings chapter 18. After many days, the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth. So Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. Now the famine was severe in Samaria. And Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, 
And when Jezebel cut off the prophets of the Lord Obadiah, took a hundred prophets and hid them by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water. And Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys. Perhaps we may find grass and save the horses and mules alive and not lose some of the animals. So they divided the land between them to pass through it. Ahab went in one direction by himself, and Obadiah went in another direction by himself. And as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him. And Obadiah recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, behold, Elijah is here. And he said, How have I sinned that you would give your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. And when they would say he is not here, he would take an oath of the kingdom or nation that they had not found you. And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here. And as soon as I have gone from you, the spirit of the Lord will carry you. I know not where. And so when I come and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. Although I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Has it not been told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord? Have we hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets by fifties in a cave and fed them with bread and water? And now you say, go tell your Lord, behold, Elijah is here and he will kill me. And Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is it you, you troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you have, and your father's house, because you have abandoned the commandments of the Lord and followed the Baals. Now therefore send and gather all Israel to me at Mount Carmel, and the 450 prophets of Baal, and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the people of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to the, all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people did not answer him a word. And Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. The two pools be given to us and let them choose one bull for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire, uh, fire to it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood and put no fire to it. And you call upon the name of your God, and I will call upon the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. All the people answered, it is well spoken. Then Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose for yourselves one bull and prepare it first. For you are many, and call upon the name of your God, but put no fire to it. And they took the bull that was given them. They prepared it, and called upon the name of Baal from morning until noon, saying, O Baal, answer us. But there was no voice, and no one answered. And they limped around the altar that they had made. Noon Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he's musing, or he's relieving himself, or he's on a journey. Or perhaps he is asleep and must be awakened. And they cried aloud and cut themselves after their custom with swords and lances until the blood gushed out upon them. And as midday passed, they raved on until the time of the offering of the oblation. But there was no voice, no one answered, no one paid attention. Then Elijah said to all the people, come near to me. And all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord came, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench about the altar as great as would contain two seahs of seed. And he put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, fill four jars of water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And they did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And they did it a third time. And the water ran around the altar and filled the trench also with water. And at the time of the offering of the oblation, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. 
Answer me, O Lord, answer me, that this people may know that you, O Lord, are God, and that you have turned their hearts back. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked the water that was in the trench, licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and said, The Lord, he is God. The Lord, he is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Let not one of them escape. And they seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brew Kishon and slaughtered them there. Elijah said to Ahab, Go up. Eat and drink, for there is a sound of the rushing of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink, and Elijah went up to the top of Mount Carmel. And he bowed himself down to the earth and put his face between his knees, and he said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. And he went up and looked and said, There's nothing. And he said, Go again seven times. And on the seventh time he said, Behold, a little cloud like a man's hand is rising from the sea. And he said, Go up, say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down, lest the rain stop you. And in a little while the heavens grew black with clouds and wind. And there was a great rain, and Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. And the hand of the Lord was on Elijah, and he gathered up his garment and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So on. May God bless his word to us and help us in our meditation on it. We're going to turn to Psalm 96 before that. Psalm 96a. This is Sing Psalms. It's on page 126, verses 1 to 9. Psalm 96a. The beginning will sing a new song to the Lord. Sing praises to his name and his salvation. Day by day, let all the earth proclaim. Let's sing down to verse 9. Shall we? 96a, verses 1 to 9. Oh, sing a new song. To the Lord. Oh, sing a new song to the Lord. Sing praises to His name.
Shall we look again at our uh, reading there in um, 1 Kings, 1 Kings 18? We could read again verse 21. Verse 21, And Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you go limping between two different opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. Compromise was the problem for the people were halting between the two different opinions, whether they would serve the Lord um, and Baal, or uh, as the challenge comes from Elijah, whether they should completely, as they should, give up, trying to compromise and try to make the best of both worlds and give themselves completely to the Lord. But just before we look briefly at that passage, just a word in the letter of James. Because I came across, you've maybe come across this, and that makes sense up to a point. Some people will look at the life of Elijah and his, his praying especially, and they'd say, well, we're not Elijah, and that's true. Elijah was unique. He was unique as a prophet and unique as a prophet for the specific calling he had. But James tells us something in the New Testament. It's on the other side of that. So to say that he was a prophet will never be prophets. What people are trying to say is, well, we shouldn't expect God to help us in our lives the way he helped Elijah, because we're no prophets like Elijah. We're not on the run from Ahab and Jezebel, and the context varies in our lives from what it did of his. And that's true. Of course it is. But verse 17 of James 5 says this, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. Elijah wasn't a great somebody. It's not that he was a great man and God thought, well, I think I'll use Elijah. It's that Elijah was just like everyone else. He had a similar nature. You have it in the old Bible. He was a man of like passions as we are, which means he was a fallen man. He wasn't an angel. Though he was a great man, he was a man still. And it's to remember that. Why are we saying that? Why remember that? Well, when you're growing up, I don't know. We wouldn't want to for any of us. But in a sense, it would be a good thing if we could tell each other what answers the Lord gave us the past week. And when you're young and when you're praying, sometimes it can be difficult. It can be almost maybe frustrating because he doesn't, you think, listen to you. But James says something else that's so important. Prayer is so amazing. To have living contact with God, not turning up and asking God for things, but saying to God that you really want, and you need to, but you really want to know him in your life. And, and then praying will take on a different dimension. A lot of other things are involved, but I won't mention in this aspect of prayer. So I know some of you pray. I hope we all pray. And so prayer is difficult for anyone. And, and there's people here who have been praying longer than some of us have been alive. They've known the Lord for that long. And they're the ones who can talk about uh, their experience and, and things like that. But I'm sure what they would say that all of us would say is that sometimes when the Lord says no, though not always, it's because we're asking maybe for the wrong thing or even asking the right thing the wrong way. James says that early on. He said, you ask and you receive not. Jesus said, ask and you will receive. I'm asking, but I'm not receiving. Well, James says, are you asking the right way? Is it all about me and what I'll get and how I'll benefit? And the difficulty there is being able to see. The difficulty is because we want things. And there's nothing that, knowing the difference between what we want and what we need, it's always a difficulty. But the more we read the Bible, the more we ask God to guide us, the more prayer will gradually, maybe slowly, make a bit more sense. And we may even be able to be praying uh, along the lines of what God wants us to ask. That's another issue, isn't it? But remember, growing up, and in the Christian way, we're praying that you all become Christians and you come to know the Lord and you serve him in your life. You'll find difficulties. The Lord will send you difficulties. He sends all of his people difficulties. Part of the reasons they show that how much he loves them which doesn't make sense. If you love some, you're gonna, you wouldn't think of making life difficult for them to show that, but we don't understand. We, we, are, we are, yeah, well, even as fathers, doesn't the Lord say if if you, being evil, know how to give good things to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give good things to those that ask him? And so the comparison is off the scale. And God's kindness, God's love in sending us gifts that don't look like gifts, sending us expressions of 
and the indications of his love may be looked like the opposite, may leave us feeling we're written off and cast off and rejected and abandoned, only for him to work through these things and to show it's not the case. Think of Elijah. Elijah is someone, the first thing you notice is, well, he's, he's given a message of proclamation. It's amazing, this life. We're told in verse 17, uh, sorry, chapter 17, verse 1, he just breaks into the scene. He's got to send a word to King Ahab. He's got to tell him that there's not going to be rain, there's not going to be rain or dew these years except by my word. Sounds easy, doesn't it? It isn't easy, but it sounds easy. Not going into the king, not, not facing a hostile environment, not that but simply announcing that God is going to send, proclaiming that God is going to do something. But that isn't all of it. You've come again to James 5. We're told that he prayed that it might not rain for three and a half years. So what Kings isn't telling us, James is telling us, that as well as the proclamation, there will be no rain or dew on the land apart from at my word. He had to go and pray about this. So he had to wrestle with God about it. Put the two chapters together. If uh, maybe it's you know it, it, it already, maybe it's obvious, and maybe just remembering that is thought provoking and challenging. That well, it would seem that it was a promise the Lord had given. Just like when it comes to what chapter we read in eighteen, uh, when we're told the word of the Lord comes to Elijah in the third year, saying, "Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain upon the earth." We know that he prayed about that. We have that in verse 41 and following. The interlude of what happens on the top of Mount Carmel is, is to vindicate God and show his uh, power and his presence behind the coming rain. Not Baal, the, the God of fertility, when someone would argue and say when the land was all, as it were, pregnant with life, they'd say Baal was in good form. But this is to show Israel who had compromised their faith and commitment. All because of Baal, Jezebel, when you think of the Baal worship, Jezebel got behind Ahab and I mean, filling the land with Satanism. It was devil worship. And the people wanted both of that. They wanted half and half. Now, this isn't Christian people. This is the professing people of God. How can you say they're not Christian? Well, anyone can say they're a Christian. We can take a box and a census and, you know, just like when you're asked these days about your gender and what do you take this, you take that and whatever you want to be. Whatever you think you are, you make it all in your own image and make yourself in your own image. But someone whose heart is truly changed, you'll see that in Elijah. Not only Elijah, but you won't see it in Ahab, you won't see it in Jezebel. And you don't even see it in the Israelites who, after seeing the miracle of fire coming down, proclaim the Lord is God. It doesn't change their lives. Miracles don't change in a, in a saving way. What has to happen, and it's, it's, it's very difficult to explain. But we don't try to, but it's what we do remind ourselves, like what the Lord said in Nicodemus, of the necessity of being born again. It's something we can't do to ourselves, just like our first birth. So the second birth, it's, it's born again, or maybe more literally, it's born from above. It's something of divine origin. But though we're passive in it, we may not be passive about it. Pray for this to happen to you. Pray for the Lord to come into your life. It's like say, well, I'm, I'm not chosen, I'm not elected, I cannot make myself born again. No, you can talk to God about it. He hasn't told you if you are or aren't, but he told you that he's the one who is behind it all. So don't make excuses out of it. How long are you saying to them? How long are you going to wait? Sitting on the fence and trying to keep your life in balance. And it's, um, well, in the New Testament, the term on the Mount terms, doesn't he make it very clear you cannot serve God and mammon. He's talking about loving one master and hating the other when we're trying to keep both in our lives. You can't, he says. It's got to be one or the other. You can't. Have you discovered that? That sense of inability. Maybe you're not happy about it. You're trying to balance. And you're listening to this, the words we read just now, when the prophet rebukes the people. If the Lord is God, then follow him. Get on with it. There's an exasperation. You know, here's a man saying, you see, because he says the opposite thing too, but if Baal is God, follow him. Make the decision. Don't try and find the middle ground that doesn't exist. There isn't a no man's land. We make it for ourselves. God doesn't provide it. We're either saved or we're lost. That's what the Bible says. And Elijah saying, how long are you going to halt? How long are you going to go limping 
I'm swaying this way, I'm swaying that way. And it depends on what's going on in my life, how religious I'll be. If things are going well, then I'll be, you don't say this, I'm not, nor did I, but it's what we do. We'll follow the ways of the world. We'll follow, without knowing it, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who's working in the sons of disobedience. And we won't realize, people aren't going around, you know, consciously aware of, just like the Pharisees weren't, consciously aware of serving Satan while they were being so religious. But he said to them, you're of your father, the devil, and the works of your father you will do. They were under Satan's control. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the ones who were behind the crucifixion. In what sense? They weren't devil worshippers. They weren't into Satanism. It wasn't occult practices. You see that later in Acts in Ephesus, where, where these things, the, the apostles come face to face with. They were believing they were following the Old Testament, and they'd have loved Elijah, and they'd have loved Moses, and even at the crucifixion, they, some of them thought the Lord was calling for Elijah. They said, let's wait and see if Elijah comes. They didn't have a clue. The Lord is calling through Elijah. And he's saying it to you and to me today. You know how you're feeling. And you know where you are. And you know this even in a Christian life. And though it's not applying in the same way, there is another sense, of course, it applies just the same. Are we drifting? Are we drifting? You know, are we drifting and are we trying to keep a food in both camps? You've maybe, you know this, that can look different. Someone mentioned, someone mentioned in passing just the other day, this someone I hadn't spoken to for years, and you know the way people can end up in different churches and so on. And he mentioned things that was happening that Christians were saying uh, to someone in his family about what they shouldn't be doing, where they should, about where the children shouldn't be going to, there was some um, thing on the children were going to be part of. And this Christian was really coming, to, coming down. It was an elder visiting and, uh, and a minister visit at a different time too. And coming down on them, they mustn't be doing this. It's, it's, it's not their business. But they weren't doing anything wrong. But the thing is, an idea and a mentality, there's a box and you're going to fit into it if you're going to belong to this church. Well, you know what that's going to do or what it should do. No one's going to be forced to fit into any box. God doesn't call us to bondage, does he? He calls us to share in the freedom. If the Son shall make you free, you will be free indeed. Free from spiritually, of course, and, and the bondage to sin and to Satan. But within all of that, you can see what happens to someone like Saul of Tarsus when he's converted. The Pharisee's gone. He's changed. He looks at it all as, in his own words in Philippians 3, he calls it dung. Very expressive. That's his old religious life. But anyway, you find the people here. And when they are being forced to make this decision, called out of being in the wrong way, drifting, and putting other things and other people and other ideas first. And it's so decisive. How long are you going to carry on doing this? Decide for yourself. No one's going to force you. People try, and they force you into a box, and they try all of this. But you know this, he's saying, you've got to make up your own mind. And you do. We all have to make up our own mind. We won't have anyone to answer for us on the last day. We won't have anyone who will come and say to us, well, I tried, or, you know, we won't have anyone to plead our case. If we aren't Christians, we hear the gospel, we have the message. And he says, well, what did you do with it? There's that part in Ezekiel 33, the watchman, he says, they heard the sound of the trumpet and they didn't take any warning. Horrible words to think about the implication. But, you know, coming from God's mouth, the horrors on our part, we can't understand it when he says their blood will be on their own head. Their blood will be on their own head. They heard the sound of the trumpet, the warning. The watchman was appointed to look on the city walls from coming danger. As soon as he saw an enemy approaching or any threat, he would sound the trumpet. The people would take note of the alarm. Uh, you know, it's been going on in Hawaii and people complaining that the most sophisticated warning system, maybe for tsunamis, of course, but they, they didn't go on in the time of the fires. And, but the, the effect of it, everyone would have heard. Everyone would have known. Everyone would have, you know, realized. And the, the watchman had that job. That if he didn't warn the people and the people died, 
you apply it spiritually, then he's going to pay for it in some way. He's going to be ha going to, their blood will be required at your hands, God says. But if you warn them and they don't listen, then their blood is on their own heads. It's an awful picture. Elijah saying that to the people decide. You know, a lot has led up to this point in Elijah's life. It's amazing to see it in such a short space of, of words, really. Chapter 17, he's called to go on a, before Ahab. He prays, the drought comes, and then he's sent to a widow in Baal's territory. A widow who's got next to nothing to survive on. And God sends him to her to provide for him. You know, this is when the brook runs, starts to run dry, and after the Lord has been providing for him with a raven, with meat and provision. And it, it all goes against logic, and this is the point of it. The Lord sometimes works that way. Why go here? Why do this? Why expect certain things to happen? Who would expect? You would expect the ravens to bring meat. The children might know. You might know that. You ever seen, well, it doesn't need to be ravens, of course, but even when you're going along the road or beside the road and you see the way the, 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 the animals gather and they, they eat whatever there is, the roadkill, as it were, and so on. But God is sending the raven to bring meat to Elijah. What's Elijah going to think? What would you think? What would I think? We'd be in awe of this because we haven't asked God. Any God has said, no, you go there. Speak to Ahab, pray, and then go here to the brook. And then when that starts running dry, he says, go to a widow. And it's like going from one extreme to the other. A place of provision, and then the place of desperation. And I'm going to impose myself on this poor woman and, and, and her son, and she cannot, the Lord saying, go and see what happens. And so he goes, and he's provided for, and then the child dies. See what's happening. If you were in God's hands or I were in God's hands and you were there to do a special, a certain work for God, as every one of us will be. David was the king of Israel, but he's mentioned in Acts, uh, Stephen's sermon in Acts 7. He's mentioned by Stephen as having served his generation. So he wasn't just sitting and, you know, being on the throne and doing what he had to do. He had a, he had a, a view of calling, a sense of calling to his generation. And some of the Psalms will reflect that. And wherever you're placed in God's will, whatever you have to do, it's the exact same, serving the Lord wherever you can with whatever he's given. And uh, in that regard, you know, you might find it and in the Christian life in general, which is a commitment to God, is it not? There may be many twists and many turns and, you know, like this instance here where the jar of flour wasn't spent or the jug of oil not running empty according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. So you imagine you're being this poor widow and you imagine here she is, the widow's son, and then everything's going so amazingly well. She isn't, I don't think, a believer when Elijah meets her, which is amazing. The Lord sends him to this woman who comes, it would seem, to faith. Verse 24 says, Now I know that you're a man of God. And that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. He raises, God raises this widow's son from the dead. Now, some people look at it and say it was the kiss of life. It's all, you know, people who look at anything to try and see, well, the way, the posture, it basically symbolizes a communication of life from him to the child. God's doing. It's expressive. None of these things are in themselves I don't think meant to, meant to signify anything but, uh, but as, as symbols of what is, is actually being done. So you can imagine, just think to put your mind around this. And then you, when you see Elijah crashing after Mount, 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 um, Mount Carmel, you think, this isn't the man who's feeling sorry for himself because it didn't work out. This is the man the Lord has put through the mill on the way here. He's not finished with him. So when you feel that yourself, you might feel and might wonder and when it comes to waiting for answered prayer or praying or trying to experience certain providences or, or the providences of other people, what would you say? What would you say? What would I say about the prophet Elijah when he ends up at this widow's house? Would you say he's made a terrible mistake? He must have been out of God's will. He couldn't have been obedient in following this way or else the worst thing, I mean, this woman was desperate that her son was going to die of, of starvation 
And then this prophet comes and asks for food and she gives what she's got for that day and then the miracles take place and then the worst happens. What would you think? You know when things go wrong, seriously wrong. Our conscience tells us, rightly or wrongly, firstly maybe anyway, that we've done something wrong or they've done something wrong. The man who was born blind, the disciples said to Jesus, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he's born like this? Jesus said, neither. But we think like that, wrongly. We think like that about ourselves. This isn't to say, like reading of Jonah, that things can, again, in God's grace, when he's going to call us back, and other things cannot go wrong or will not go wrong when we're on the run. But as that when they go wrong, it doesn't mean we're on the run. I think that's, that's what's happening. And you can see this with Elijah. And what the Lord is doing with him, he brings him to one place. And then he seems to bring him right down. Brings him to the next place and brings him right down. You see that? Maybe that's life, isn't it? They mount to heaven, then to the depths. Psalm 107 says, they do go down again. It's the story. But you know, it's... Sometimes, and, and you've maybe been on a small boat, you don't really see it so much on the, on the ferry and things, but you maybe see it in a small, you're out in a small boat, you'd be on a rib, and sometimes you can't see past the wave that's coming. Very exciting. But at the same time, you can't see past the next one. When you're in the trough, when you're down there, you're surrounded by the water. You're not in the water, hopefully, but you can see it coming, surrounding you. And the psalmist speaks about God's billows going over his head. But seeing all of that, it's leading up to this amazing event on the top of the mountain where the Lord is going to show in answer to prayer that he is the God of Israel. See, Elijah's ready for it. And it's not that the Lord is pointlessly, in any shape or form, doing things in his life or sending him things in his uh, experiences that they're all contributing all contributing. See, the Lord isn't finished with, with Elijah. Elijah has a lot to learn. We've got a lot to learn. You see, at this point, we're just going to, just going to finish this now. The, the, what we know about Elijah, and by saying that, and we say it with, we mean it with the utmost respect, is the Lord was going to show Elijah the way he works isn't the way Elijah's expecting. See, he's on the mountaintop. He's got, he's got the prophets of... Um, He's got 450 prophets of Baal, verse 19 says, and there's 400 prophets of Asherah who all eat at Jezebel's table. Imagine, you know, you put the news on and this is who you're seeing. This is who you're seeing assembling with reps of the White House and all the rest of them. Satanists. This is what's happening in Israel. Black Satanists. Black, dark, from hell, no light. And there's no messing with these things. God is clear about who's behind. And it's not, see, like when they're crying aloud, verse 28, cutting themselves. You know, they're harming themselves. They're slicing them. Their blood is going all over them. What do they do? They're trying to manipulate. Who's a bloodthirsty God? Who do you ever hear about with sacrifices, see, particularly of children? In the Old Testament, you'll hear about it tragically today at times. The same, similar, a bloodthirsty and they believe there's a reception of power through that act that the deity or the divine being they believe in and are offering to will give them as a return. They'll be able to do magic and the arts will be there, but that's, it's not related to these. It's just someone who loves murder. The thief comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus said, but I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. No, they can't do it, but they would, have, they would have been in that frenzy because they believed it would work. What did they see before this? I don't know. We don't know. But we're, we're wrong to think that it was an empty ideology, that there wasn't or wouldn't have been any real experience involved. And you, if you come across Satanists talking about these, some of them on the public face, they'll talk about the fact they don't believe in, in, a, in a devil or a saint. Of course they do. They say that they don't because his biggest trick or the biggest trick as it were up his sleeves to try and get people to not believe he even exists. We even hear about people in Hollywood having strange meetings. People selling their souls. This isn't Old Testament stuff simply. And it isn't hyped up. It's not hyped up. 
If you not people talking about, you see the person talking themselves. Sometimes they're not even Christians. And there's people who will warn against any sort of involvement in these things. They've seen what can happen. See, God is challenging them. Elijah is the servant he's going to use. And God is going to answer prayer by sending fire from heaven. It comes down. The people fall on their faces. And it would seem, would it not, that they've said the Lord is God. Your hand on heart. That they've been converted and changed when they haven't been. So Elijah leaves that place. After praying intensely. And telling Elijah the rain is coming. Telling Ahab that the rain is coming. And Ahab eats and drinks, gets on his chariot. But Elijah beats him. How? Think about it. children to think about that? Elijah didn't have a chariot. But he beat Ahab to the destination. Tell you the secret, the answer, not the secret. The key to it is what Obadiah said to him. A wee bit earlier in the chapter. I'm not going to say any more because then you'll have the answer. Think about that. It's a wonderful thing. And again, look in something that's said about um, the Ethiopian eunuch and uh, Philip in Acts. What happens to Philip? Have a think about these things. Let's be challenged, friends. Would we be encouraged? But the proclamation, there's prayer, but there's these promises. The rain came. And what an episode in this man's life. Who knows what the Lord's doing just now, making you pray, making you wait. And like Elijah, you've got your, as it were, your, your head at your knees and you're waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting. But you know what? You keep looking for the answer. There's times you don't. There's, then it revives and comes back. Keep going. Let's keep praying. Let's keep waiting. Let's pray just now. Let's pray. Lord, our God, for these words that we read of to be translated into reality in our lives and where it has been the case where even now before you there will be thanksgiving rising from hearts to remember times of divine intervention and the divine deliverance sometimes coming in such unusual ways thank you for all of your dealings we pray for grace lord to walk humbly with you and like Peter says, where it's necessary at certain times to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God, when your hand is upon us, that in due time you will exalt us. So help, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing some verses from Psalm 91. Scottish Psalter, Psalm 91, page 352, 352. Sing at verse 14, the last three stanzas, that's the verses. Psalm 91, verse 14. Because on me he set his love, I'll save and set him free. Because my great name he has known, I will him set on high. Let's sing from 14 to the end of the psalm. Because on me he sets his love, I'll set. Because on me he sets his love, I'll set.
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.